Uh, good morning and um, welcome to uh, our wonderful panel this morning um, at the Milken Institute um, a conference today. Um, today's panel is on infrastructure and the title of our panel is Showtime for Infrastructure Accelerating Shovel Ready Infrastructure Projects. And we've got a great panel um, of speakers today um, who bring a tremendous amount of insights on how to really break through and, and accelerate action um, on the ground uh, for infrastructure, but also bringing together a number of different uh, perspectives from the financial pers financial sector and finan financial perspectives. Um, we know Infrastructure Week has been something that a number of people have been talking about over the last several years. Uh, infrastructure Week has come, it has gone. Uh, a lot of people are talking about infrastructure, but now today we have Congress um, who's put up some serious money to fix roads and bridges and connect broadband and address you know, other essential projects. Um, the resilience topic and the climate topic is central to this. In fact, um, just yesterday, the administration announced a number of actions that are squarely at the center, at the intersection of resilient infrastructure and, and meant to help address the climate challenge, um, specifically in clean energy and transmission. Um, the jobs angle cannot be overstated. Climate related jobs will be the jobs of the future. Um, but the numbers are really big. Um, in reality, the US uh, has about a $10 trillion investment gap for infrastructure by 2050. And without leveraging federal funding to spur innovation, drive down maintenance costs, enhance resilience, and engage capital for community impact, we're not going to achieve all of the goals that we need to achieve. Um, so I'm pretty excited to have this panel today to explain how the US can meet some of our key challenges um, for building and scaling modern community-led infrastructure that has uh, uh, positive climate impacts and builds resilience. Um, and we'll get into some really important discussions about how to de-risk projects, how to manage financing, how to deploy the workforce, um, et cetera. Um, my name is Stacy Swan. I'm the CEO of Climate Finance Advisors. We work at the intersection of climate and finance and do a lot of work with uh, investors and financiers who are really looking to, to integrate that climate angle into infrastructure and, and build in resilience and, and ways to finance around that. Um, my panel brings a wide range of um, experiences. We have um, uh, Nat uh, Cohane from the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, um, and Colin Amara from the National Wildlife Federation, Christine Harada from the Federal Permitting and Improvement Steering Council, and uh, Jim Pass from Guggenheim Partners. And this group is, is going to really get into a discussion um, uh, uh, about how to bring some of these things together. Um, our themes are around challenges um, for community-led infrastructures, the steps that are needed to be taken to accelerate community-led projects and the role of public and private sector in these projects. So given our time, let's just dive in uh, and I'll start uh, with you, uh, Nat, um, for the first question. Um, you've worked in the White House and you now run C2ES um, and you've seen um, how the public and the private sector work together. Um, you uh, were at COP26 and you're, you, you are uh, definitely uh, plugged into what um, Congress is doing. Can you paint us a picture of the challenges that lie ahead in terms of scaling climate and resilient infrastructure that's community-based? Sure, thanks Thanks so much, Stacey. And thanks to the Milken Institute for having this panel and having me on. For those of you who don't know, C2ES is a nonprofit that works with business and policymakers to accelerate the transition to a resilient and thriving net zero economy. And I'm really pleased to be here. And I'll, as you suggest, Stacey, maybe I'll just set up the sort of level of the challenge, especially with respect to where we need to get in the next decade, both in reducing emissions um, and, and, but also in building resilience to, to the climate impacts we're seeing and connecting that to the infrastructure that we need to build out. Um, so I, I'm sure the audience knows that in, back in uh, April of last year, the president, President Biden laid out a really ambitious goal and now committed the U.S. to that goal under the Paris Agreement of cutting emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. So that's all greenhouse gas emissions across the economy. And just to give some perspective, right now or last year, we were at 17%. That was a little bit of a dip of a 
uh, of a of a uh, increase from 2020 and with the pandemic. So we're at about 17 percent below 2005. Now we need to get to 50 to 52 percent to meet that target and to be on track to the long term goal of a net zero economy where we're balancing the emissions we have with removals from the atmosphere by 2050. So what is it going to take to get there? Well, on the mitigation side, in terms of reducing emissions, um, I tend to break it down by sector. And, and a lot of this comes from a report that the Rhodium Group recently released about that level of that challenge. Uh, the power sector is where the tons are, in a sense, right? It used to be in 2005, the power sector used to be the largest source of emissions in the U.S. economy. Since then, the power sector has cut emissions about a third. That's a result of renewable power, a result of natural gas displacing coal. But we really need to get the power sector to cut even much more deeply, down to about 80 percent below 2005 levels. Um, and so if you look at where the tons are going to come from in the next decade, you know, 40 percent of those tons, the reductions that need to happen are in the power sector. That means building out renewable power. That means building out transmission lines, a smarter grid. That means permitting. I know we'll get into a lot of that. So that's all infrastructure. Second area to think about is transportation. Right now, that is the largest sector, cars and trucks, in particular on-road vehicles. And what we need to do is really electrify uh, that vehicle fleet. That gets you a fair amount of the way by 2030. It, it really is going to be critical to a net zero economy by 2050. But we have to start now because it takes so long to turn over car and truck fleets. And that also means infrastructure. That means EV charging stations. That means building out a grid that can accommodate electric vehicles. And it means really putting electric vehicle charging everywhere that you have a gas station now, if you think about it that way. And so that's also a lot of infrastructure build, uh, in addition to just the new manufacturing and supply chains we need uh, to get the batteries. And then the last sector, you've got industry. Um, a lot it, within that industry sector, a lot of uh, in near-term emissions reductions that can come just by uh, reducing methane leaks from oil and gas pipelines and distribution. Again, a story about infrastructure. A lot of times we think about that as something you can kind of fix with a wrench. I mean, you've got to, you've got to monitor the leaks and, and find them. But a lot of that is just uh, fixing uh, existing leaks and tightening up the existing oil and gas infrastructure. Of course, over time, we need to get off of oil and gas, and that'll help the methane emissions as well. In the longer run for industry, it's really about building out carbon capture technology, which is just beginning to be put in place. We need to really build that out, and that's going to mean more pipelines uh, and a much bigger infrastructure investment as well. So that's the kind of level of the challenge just to get to 2030 across all those sectors. We've seen some progress, obviously, last fall's bipartisan infrastructure framework or the IIJA, the Investment and Jobs Act, um, put in place some important infrastructure spending around electric vehicles, around the transmission grid, around methane from abandoned wells. Uh, but what we really are going to need is a, is a much bigger investment. And, and that would come with the potentially with the Build Back Better Act. I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go forward. Um, finally, resilience, also something really important to keep in mind. On uh, We just saw a report recently that last year there were 20 $1 billion plus uh, climate disasters in the U.S. last year. So we really need to be building out resilient spending as well. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of damages and costs for sure. Um, absolutely. Thanks, Nat. I, I'll move now to Colin. Um, so Colin, you know, uh, your thoughts um, on key areas of climate resilient infrastructure from where you sit. Um, you know, uh, not all of the resilient infrastructure that can be done gets the headlines. Um, obviously, utility scale wind and, you know, uh, transport, as Nat said, is, is, you know, something that is getting a lot of um, airtime. But are there other things from where you sit in, in particular around natural infrastructure that, that should be considered? Yeah, no, thank you, Stacey, and thanks to, to Dan and the entire team of the Millikan Institute for having me on this panel. Um, like, I think there's a huge opportunity, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the climate disasters that a lot of us have been, been kind of warning about for a long time are, are more and more a part of our day-to-day -day life. I mean, from the wildfires in the West, to the hurricanes in the Southeast, to the drought conditions, the record temperatures, even the, the more extreme, you know, winter storms that we're seeing. And um, I'm, I'm kind of here to kind of make the case that you know, investments in natural solutions are the ultimate one-two punch. They can make us much more resilient um, in terms of mitigating the harms from these more extreme weather events and, and other climate impacts. And at the same time, they also are potential carbon sinks that can reduce emissions significantly. You know, I mean, if we actually, if we actually maximize the, the ability of our, our forests and wetlands and grasslands and other systems, we could mitigate almost a, a quarter to a third 
of our overall emissions. Now, again, that doesn't mean we should not do everything else that Nat just mentioned. We have to do all of it and more. Um, but there's a huge, a huge opportunity here. And one of the things that you know, we're really proud of uh, working with the bipartisan uh, kind of gang of, I guess it was 10 and then 14 and then 21 and everything on the IIJA um, was that natural climate solutions were in, kind of on equal footing for the first time. You know, massive investments in the health of our forests and reforestation, big investments in wetland restoration, coastal resilience, um, really trying to get at these, um, these, these opportunities that can create a ton of jobs, um, create opportunities in you know, some more rural places that frankly need the economic, need the economic benefit, but also can help mitigate these you know, tens of hundreds of billions of dollars of costs that we're seeing as, from these extreme weather events. And so um, I'm hoping that folks that are paying attention today to this panel um, will see the kind of the natural climate solutions that is, is completely is central and complementary, not competing, but a, a necessary part of the, of the equation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're going to see more and more extreme events. I mean, the, the amount of carbon that's already in the atmosphere, the amount of methane that's already in the atmosphere, we can mitigate the harms long-term, but one of the best ways to do that is with natural, solution, natural solutions. And like, as Nat was just talking about carbon capture technology, not only are you going to sequester a bunch of carbon, it's incredibly bipartisan. I mean, there's great bipartisan support for these types of investments. So depending on what happens in the future with the balance of Congress, this is one of those areas, both in agriculture and in forestry in particular, that could be a, a great bipartisan place to keep the climate momentum moving in the years ahead. Thanks, Colin. And um, you made some really important points and, and particularly the kind of points you made about it's, it's all of the above. It's not just the hard infrastructure, but also the natural infrastructure and the resilience needs are just going to increase um, as time goes on uh, because of the warming we already have locked in. So uh, very, really important points. I want to turn to you, Christine. Um, you know, you are in a really critical position um, at the Federal per Permitting Improvement Steering Council. Um, permitting and um, the kind of, you know, policy and bureaucratic infrastructure that's going to be needed to accelerate some of these, um, some of these investments faster. It's going to be really important in terms of uh, our ability to start planning and executing on these infrastructure plans quickly. Um, we can't deploy fast without faster permitting. Can you give us a sense of what you are doing um, in your role and, and a, a little bit of kind of how that's um, meant to align and, and contribute to that fast deployment that we all uh, recognize? Sure, absolutely. So thank you firstly again to the Milken Institute for having me. I'm the executive director of the Federal Permitting and Proven Steering Council. Uh, and I anticipate many members of this audience may have never heard of us before. Uh, we're a newer independent agency that was stood up for the express purpose of coordinating the permitting of large complex infrastructure projects. And we do that across our 13 federal agencies. Um, our goal is to provide transparency into the environmental reviews and authorizations, and we do that via a publicly available dashboard. And the end result of that, of course, is to provide better predictability and certainty on permitting decisions. Um, of course, you know, responsible siting and project permitting can help enable the steady growth of a thriving industry uh, while ensuring that we're doing appropriate protection of the environment and maximizing opportunities, you know, whether it be for, for the land or ocean co-use, um, as you likely saw in the news yesterday. Uh, the administration made some major announcements that are really big leaps forward on wind, solar, transmission, and other clean energy projects to create those high quality jobs and deliver the affordable carbon pollution free electricity across the nation that we all desperately need. Uh, there are seven federal agencies that announced a whole ton of projects and plans um, that showcase our unprecedented coordination in activating the entire government to help fight climate change while producing good paying union jobs and accelerating our clean energy economy. Obviously, I'm super excited about the announcement. There's so much good stuff in there about investments uh, that we're making in the U.S. to enhance our infrastructure and to, you know, just to paint a finer picture on our work, for example, you know, with offshore wind power plants, right? So investments that are about $2 billion for each wind farm alone have tremendous impacts on fishing, recreation, local communities, military missions, radar, et cetera. Um, and so it is expressly our job to make sure that we are coordinating across the various agencies to be able to do that. I recognize that the permitting process has historically been lengthy and rather uncertain, uh, which of course has slowed the pace of development, provided a challenging environment, perhaps to put it politely for financial investment. Um, but in these past two years, pace has really dramatically improved simply because we have a much more integrated appro approach across all the federal agencies that are involved uh, in the process. 
And to that end, if you like, you know, you want to check out the website itself, it's called at permits.performance.gov, um, where you will see what are all the projects that we are tracking, where do things stand with respect to the permitting activities, and hopefully again in the end that we will deliver that predictability and certainty to all stakeholders. Thanks, Christine. Um, a really nice overview, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but Jim, I actually want to kind of uh, leverage kind of what Christine said about you know accelerating the investment side of things. Um, maybe you can give your perspectives around what you're seeing from the from the financial sector. Not all resilient infrastructure is financed by the public sector. A lot of it's financed by the private mm -hmm. sector, and infrastructure investors are starting to. Uh, think about what resilience means in terms of uh, value at risk. Um, uh, maybe you can um, give us a sense, what are, what are major investors looking for? And, and in particular, kind of what are you seeing from the financial sector? Great. Well, um, you know, thank you very much for um, <clears throat> inviting me and, and Dan and the rest of the team um, at the Milken Institute. Um, you know, first, I think all we've heard today is um, we've got a lot of work to do. And um, I think it's important to, when you look at infrastructure and, and whether it's climate or ESG or resilience or sustainability, I think it's a very um, um, easy challenge at the end of the day. We, we've got to create solutions that are both innovative as well as traditional to satisfy the funding gap. Um, we can't rely on the government, whether it's the US government or other countries or our states or local communities to, um, to basically rebuild the infrastructure um, in the United States and around the world. And what we've been doing at Guggenheim as well as with other institutional investors um, are, are really trying to identify what are the standards um, to measure sustainability? Well, how do you measure climate outside of carbon? How do you measure the impact of an asset? And along those lines, um, you know, everybody will do their financial analysis um, it's very standard. There may be different approaches or different scenarios, but when you go beyond that initial credit work, that's where the data um, becomes very, very um, thin. And it's very, um, you know, it's up to my team or someone else's team to interpret what that may be. And so at Guggenheim, we've created something called the sustainable quotient, where we look at um, you know, environmental concerns, um, social aspects, as well as transparency. And climate um, touches each aspect of that. And I think until the, the government sector and the private sector kind of come to a, um, an agreement on what the data should be, um, rather than converging all these different standards or labeling, um, we keep on multiplying those. And whether there's different topics called sure, or equal or the UN SDGs and the World Bank concerns. You know, the United States um, really needs to, to focus on how do we get private capital in to solve this funding problem? Because, you know, um, what we heard initially was there's a $10 trillion problem. The, the, the municipal market and, you know, can't handle that by themselves. So we need to get private capital um, like we've seen in renewables, whether they're solar farms or wind farms, um, the power aspect, um, th that's really where the private capital came to the infrastructure space initially in the United States. But globally, we have a lot of private capital chasing transportation projects, privatization of airports, of hospitals, and so forth. So there comes to a point where, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, if we're going to do community-led projects, um, that the data that I can use to assess climate is going to be the same and common and has the credibility associated with that. And so the designing of standards um, is what we're doing a lot of time with. And we have a partnership with the WWF and we've sponsored um, about four different reports analyzing the standard, standards that have been used around the world. And we're actually assessing projects with those standards in the United States. And once that gets accepted, um, just like the rating agencies, just like accounting measures, I think you'll see a lot more private capital going into projects rather than, you know, focusing, um, well, we still have a lot more, but I mean, I mean the, the, the rush of private capital would be enhanced. And I think that's really where this conversation will go is that we identify the needs. We have a great program from the federal government 
now we have to kind of come sources on how do we match it with capital from the, the private um, sector. Uh, really good points, and and this is all going to be challenged by our time horizons uh, for sure. Uh, yeah. If you look at the announcements from the the administration yesterday, they want to they they have a target of deploying uh, thirty gigawatts of wind in by twenty thirty. Uh, but a lot of that has to start now. If those wind um, investments need to be kind of permitted and and financed and kind of put in train now. If you're going to get those realized in eight years. Right. I mean, that's eight years. Uh, 2030 still feels for some people kind of as a as a marker a little further out of the horizon of what you can understand. Uh, but it's really right around the corner. Right. Um, and, and then kind of, Jim, Jim uh, your comments about, you know, uh, the the data and the standards are really well taken. Uh, a lot of people, this is kind of a new area, and a lot of people are trying to get their hands around this. But how do you do that and have action in if your time horizon is eight years? This is going to be very dynamic over the next couple of years, uh, which is going to be an interesting thing to, to watch and experience. Um, and we need the rush of capital because that $10 trillion number is something that public balance sheets alone would never be able to support. Um, Christine, maybe I'll turn to you given um, the references to yesterday's announcements by the administration. Um, is there anything in those announcements that gives you hope uh, in terms of um, your work, uh, but also the, um, the ambition that we have to have in terms of resilient infrastructure investments? Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's so many good things in that announcement to include things on uh, offshore wind, which of course is a brand new clean energy industry in the United States that can create nearly 80,000 good paying jobs by 2030. Um, you know, both through the offshore wind lands, offshore lands becoming available for lease sale off the coast of New York and New Jersey. There are port announcements, uh, port investment announcements by the Department of Transportation to help build and stage uh, a lot of the offshore wind turbine components and manufacturing of that. Uh, announcements of partnering with NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, to help promote cooperative ocean use. Uh, of course, we had DOE announce it's better, building a better grid initiative to accelerate the deployment of new transmission lines. Of course, many renewable energy production projects are currently in process and we're very much working on very much hard at work uh, on all that stuff, but we need the transmission to be able to get that energy to consumers. And a lot of the announcements are also not just for the urban areas, um, but also for the rural communities as well. So for example, the Department of Agriculture announced a program to support clean energy in the more underserved rural communities. And I think that, you know, a lot of the work that we've been going, that is currently underway, um, again, has uh, a, a ton of unprecedented level, level of cooperation across all of the federal agencies. And that might be something that is not super obvious um, if you're not within the federal government, but the degree to which we are all lockstep uh, and working hand, hand in hand on this uh, is also super impressive. Of course, with the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in November, that also expanded the TIFIA program, right? The Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act um, that provides credit assistance, so a lot of blended finance opportunities um, to help fill those market gaps. Uh, we've also expanded the authority of the DOE's loan program office to invest in projects that increase our domestic supply of critical minerals and expanding uh, its programs in manufacturing, uh, especially for things like zero carbon technologies for medium and heavy duty vehicles and trains and aircraft, et cetera. And one last point I'd like to add, of course, you know, private capital is super important, um, but also just as important is human capital. Right? One can only throw so much money at a problem, but if you don't have the right smart people on the ground actually doing their work, kind of no use. So when combined with the Build Back Better Act, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law adds an average of one and a half million jobs per year over the course of the decade, while accelerating our path to full employment and increasing that labor force participation in climate jobs. Yes, what an important point um, that the kind of armies of people that we need to be addressing climate change across all different types of uh, uh, industries and, and activities is going to be really important. Um, uh, Nat, maybe I'll come to you um, on the solution side. Anything uh, that you would like to highlight to us in terms of innovative solutions that can help uh, reduce emissions, I'm thinking of carbon capture or hydrogen or anything from the C2ES perspective that you think absolutely needs to be part of A, all of the above and accelerated. Um, fewest number of most important kind of things from that perspective. 
Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I'll just mention two quickly, and, and, and I'll pick up on the two you mentioned, carbon capture and hydrogen. And I, I said a little bit about carbon capture with a 2030 time frame because we need to get started even in the next decade. But where it really comes in is to get to a net zero economy by 2050, we need to be capturing carbon from industrial facilities that burn that, that may still burn fossil fuels like natural gas. And we also need to be pulling carbon out of the sky. We also need, I'll, I'll say separately, although I'm not going to talk about it with respect to infrastructure, Colin mentioned natural infrastructure, nature-based solutions, that also is a big potential source of pulling carbon out of the sky as well. And that's really important too. But I'm thinking about, you know, industrial facilities, technologies. And if you think about both carbon capture and hydrogen, which could be if it were produced with renewable energy, produced in a way that didn't have any carbon emissions, hydrogen is a really important store of energy. It can be a fuel that could have a lot of industrial applications where electricity uh, isn't really applicable because you need direct heat and that sort of thing. So carbon capture and hydrogen really important for the net zero economy of the future. And you know a lot of the conversation around both of those talks about innovation, the needs for lower cost technologies to create hydrogen, the need for cheap renewable energy to make it, the need for carbon capture technologies to come way down in cost. All of that's true. But even if we solve those innovation challenges, the deployment challenge is really enormous. And uh, and the and that means infrastructure. And so I'll just leave you with one sort of stat. Uh, if you if you look at the natural gas infrastructure just in the United States right now, we've got two and a half million miles of natural gas pipelines around the country. We've got five thousand miles of CO two pipeline. So and and we basically have zero hydrogen. So we're going to need a huge build out of infrastructure if we're going to pull that carbon from the sky and if we're going to create the hydrogen and get it to places. We need a huge infrastructure. We need to be purpose built because hydrogen, if it leaks, is a greenhouse gas. So there's a huge amount of work to be done just to deploy those technologies, even if we get the innovation challenges solved. Excellent, thanks, Nat. We have, we're have we running short on time, so I'm gonna um, turn to Colin and to Jim for the for our lightning round, and then if we have some time for others. Uh, Colin, you know, um, what any final points that you'd like to raise and maybe in particular on the jobs and and um you know armies of people that we need to build uh, uh for the build back better prospects and pipeline and um deploying and and realizing our uh, resilient infrastructure yeah i mean i think my, my final point would just be that the the infrastructure package is historic it's amazing it does a ton of things we always have to implement it well and christine's on the case and like there's a lot of things we have to do to make sure that that's implemented it's not nearly enough if we don't pass the Build Back Better Act and the climate provisions in that, we can't hit the 50 to 52 percent of the presence laid out that Nat just talked about and leverage the private, private capital that James has been talking about. I mean, like, and so I just want to feel like I want to talk about Monty Python, but like, it's not dead. I just want everyone on the screen to know, like, negotiations are underway. Senator Manchin himself has said that, you know, the, the climate provisions aren't like the, the point of the sticking point right now. There's a few final points we have to kind of kind of finalize, but um, that package is transformative. The amount of private capital to leverage is historic. The amount of the... the that's where the, the 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 ability to do something at that scale, right? I mean, this is a mobilization for World War II, right? I mean, this is of that of that you know the New Deal kind of kind of scale. Um, I just would encourage everyone on the screen to still lean in. Like that package, the climate provisions are incredibly important. Do everything we've talked about today, because without it, it's very difficult to get there. And I'd much rather be in a world that do, achieves our goals through investment and collaboration as opposed to the regulation and litigation. So, I will leave you with that. That's really great, James. At sure. Uh, your lightning round response, and also maybe with a with a finance angle, there's a lot of leveraging that's expected. Anything that you think we should know? So I guess I have three things. One, um, I think everybody in the country and on the panel had a lot of good points, but I think the biggest challenge is that there's a fundamental challenge that we have to accept the fact that the private sector is a critical component in developing and owning infrastructure. And I think owning is very critical in this country because really the municipal market is always given the ownership of infrastructure to the, to the government. Projects are local. I don't think we can forget that. So I think we have to balance what the federal government wants to do with the local governments um, because projects have to be bankable to get private capital to work. And lastly, I think everybody has to realize that if there is a risk and we can manage that or we can measure that risk with standards, the private sector can design tools to basically manage that risk. And that means capital can flow. That means projects will get done. And I think understanding the combination of where private and public sectors can work together, um, there's great examples. There's also been some missteps, 
But in this bill, I think there's better opportunity to prove that whether it's climate or ESG or sustainability, it's all going to come together. And we just have to be very um, prudent on how we deploy and take advantage of the tools in the bill. That's amazing. Thank you um, very much, James, and everybody on the panel for all of your insights. This, uh, James, your last comment tees up the next panel that we can suggest to the Milken Institute, because that risk sharing between public and private uh, sectors, between public and private dollars is going to be so critical. So I want to um, thank you all for being on this wonderful panel. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, really looking forward to seeing kind of where we go from here. Um, and thanks a lot. Thank you.